Give us just a second here, folks. We are having a technical issue with the live stream. Okay, this is Carly Houchin at KHI. Thanks for bearing with us for just a second there. Our um, live stream should now be up and running. Um, but uh, Sydney on, on the KHI team, if I could uh, have you double check that, that would be super helpful. This is Sydney, will do. Great, thank you. Okay, so I think um, most folks are here. Some might be in the process of joining, um, but as the last couple of people get on the line, I um, wanted to start by providing a, a, a brief overview of the um, uh, agenda for our meeting today. Um, and then we will do some introductions so everyone um, knows who's on the line here. So you should have received um, the agenda um, in an email ahead of the meeting, along with other materials. Um, it is also shared on my screen here. Um, so you should be able to, to view it live as well. Um, other materials that you would have received in advance include the working group charter, um, the recommendation rubric, which was um, developed after discussion with the special committee um, at the end of August. Um, also in that email, you received the um, crosswalk of existing recommendations put together by KLRD. We'll reference that later in the meeting. Um, and that's it. Yeah, so those four documents. Um, and so uh, we'll get started with introductions in just a moment. Then we'll have a brief um, Coma and Cora overview from the revisor's office. So uh, primer on um, open meetings and open records and how that will um, impact the work of this group. Then we'll have a brief conversation on working group process, just setting us up to collaborate well together in this virtual space. Then we'll get into our some of our topic specific discussion. Um, we'll, we'll discuss that KLRD crosswalk of existing recommendations, um, specifically spending some time um, brainstorming uh, additional barriers that are not addressed by any of the existing recommendations so that we have those to come back to um, when we're doing the deep dive on those topics. As a reminder to the group, the um, uh, topics that have been assigned to this group by the special committee include um, data systems, uh, interactions with the legal system and law enforcement, system transformation, and then telehealth as it um, specifically relates to system capacity and transformation. So telehealth um, is an issue that will be taken up by each of the three groups um, with the specific lens um, related to their, their kind of broader directive. So after some of that brainstorming work, we will um, pilot the recommendation rubric. We'll select one of the existing recommendations to drop in there and, and kind of do a run through of using that tool um, just to get a sense of that. And then we will end the meeting with some um, administrative updates, confirming a chair and vice chair um, for the working group and, and discussing some upcoming meeting details. Then we will adjourn by 1.30. So with that, um, our first item on the agenda is some introductions. And I'll um, offer some brief instructions for that. Um, thought it would be helpful um, as we go around and introduce um, everyone on the call, if you provide um, a little bit of your background, 
um, just describing for the group some of the experiences you bring with you um, kind of relevant to the work the group will be doing. If we can keep those comments at about a minute or less, um, that would be super helpful just in terms of um, getting through our, our, our full agenda for the day. Then in addition to that, that background on yourself, um, if you could also provide your answer to the question, um, if recommendations from this group could remove one barrier in the mental health system, what would that be? So I'll ask for a volunteer to, to kick us off here in just a minute, but I'll, I'll give us those instructions one more time. So a little bit of your background, one minute or less there. Um, I, um, we haven't done meeting agreements or ground rules or anything, but just a heads up, I, I might jump in if we get too far over a minute there. So um, appreciate keeping those comments relatively brief. Um, and then also your answer to the question, um, if recommendations from this group could remove one barrier in the mental health system, what would that be? Do we have a volunteer who'd like to kick off introductions? I can go. Um, my name is Representative Shu. Uh, I represent House District 25, which is Northeast Johnson County. Um, I, I think the, the most intriguing thing for me, and, and it fits a little bit into a larger national conversation, but just how, how can we enable law enforcement to work closer together with mental health uh, professionals? You know, you're hearing articles kind of nationwide on experiments, and I think it's an interesting look to see how we can remove the barrier on, on um, you know, asking less of our law enforcement officers and then putting actual professional mental health professionals um, in the field a little bit. Great. Thank you, Representative Shu. Um, now I'm going to kind of run down the line and, and call on people here. So the, the first person that I'm seeing on, on my roster of participants here is uh, Representative Landwehr. Yes, Representative Landwehr and I represent a section of uh, west side of Wichita chair of the social, well, I have been chair of the social services budget committee and currently chair of the health and human services committee and have had a great deal of interest in the area of mental health for the last several years and feel very privileged to be involved in this today. I would have to say that, um, you know, I, I liked uh, Shoe's deal on the law enforcement because there is a lot of experiments and I think that we can enhance those. And mine would probably be to address the work for, work, sh workforce shortage. Thank you, Representative. Um, next on the list, I'm seeing um, Andrea Clark. Hello, uh, Andrea Clark, Behavioral Health Services Commission at KDADS. I'm currently the CIT and Veterans Program Coordinator um, and previously had worked on the adult services team working with SUD treatment programs and providers um, and the Can Care program. Um, my background prior to joining KDADS was doing clinical mental health work in local corrections. Um, and I, I, would, I would hope, I think if I would have to pick one uh, recommendation or area of improvement, it would be on um, improving data systems and the ability to collect data on both mental health and other behavioral health issues across both um, law enforcement and corrections and the health system in general. So. Great, thank you. Next person I'm seeing is Kyle Kessler. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kyle Kessler, Executive Director of the Association of Community Mental Health Centers. Uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to be part of this process and on this work group. My background, I've been working in health and human services public policy for around 20 years. Uh, first with the Department of Social and Rehabilitation Services, uh, where I had gone after being in the Governor's Budget Office for several years, and then worked in the child welfare world and public policy for about seven years, and now I've been at our association for also about seven years. Um, I would say that as, as barriers go, I certainly would echo what Andrea said in terms of data systems and the importance of information that we can apply to reducing access barriers, specifically any progress we can make at eliminating the moratoriums at the state mental health hospital uh, would, would be tremendous. So that's, that's what I would say at this point. Great, thank you. Um, next I'm seeing Secretary Howard. 
Thank you. Um, I'm also really glad to be here as part of um, this group. Um, in terms of my background, you know, I'm currently the secretary for KDATS and DCF, but I've been around um, human service systems in Kansas for a long time. Um, I'm, I'm old enough to remember um, the initial phases of mental health reform a few decades ago. Um, I can't remember, I think I might have been on legislative staff at that point, not even in an agency role. So, uh, and, and I just remember, I mean, I just mentioned that piece because I just remember kind of the promise and hope. Um, and, and sometimes I, when I reflect now um, with regard to mental health reform, I think about the fact that um, a lot of progress was made in the early years. And then I think um, there are some pieces of that promise that may be stalled out. So, um, so I, I guess what I would say about a barrier, um, I, I'm not going to pick a, a really specific topic area, but I think um, I really view the barrier as what is it that hold, you know, I really want to address what holds us back from sustaining progress, you know, um, you know, how do I, I think the barrier is really kind of having the lack of the strongest um, infrastructure we can have around mental health supports so that we can assure we can sustain progress in whatever areas we're trying to advance um, at any given point in time. I, I just think that strong infrastructure, which from my perspective, um, COVID has really brought forth that need as well. So thank you. Thank you. Next I'm seeing Sandra Burke. Have to get myself off of mute. Hi, I'm Sandra Berg. I am the Behavioral Health Director at United Healthcare. And prior to joining Managed Care, I served in many roles within the mental health system, from substance use to community mental health centers to hospital um, to <laughs> I think I've done it just about all um, PRTF. So. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to work with this group and I think I will echo what um, Secretary Howard just said about building an infrastructure from our perspective with managed care we see gaps in services across the system we see difficulty flowing from system to system so I think those are barriers that hopefully we can address in this group Thank you. Next, I'm seeing um, Spence Cohen. Hi, Spence Cohen. I am the court services uh, specialist with the Office of Judicial Administration. I've only been in this position for six months, but previous to that, for the last 25 years, I, uh, I've worked as a community corrections and intensive supervision officer um, for six years, and then the rest of the time was a court services officer. Um, with Franklin County, Anderson County, um, Johnson County. So I've worked in big and small districts. Uh, probation is my, my go-to thing that I've done. Um, the biggest barrier that I have seen in career for defendants and probationers is, is cost. It's, it's extremely prohibitive for, for these individuals to, to be able to afford to do treatment. And often that, that's the cause that they do not do treatment. So that, if, if there would be a way to, to reduce those for, those for that population, I think that would be extremely helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Next I'm seeing Stuart Little. Hi, my name is Stuart Little. I'm not supposed to be here, but I'm filling in for Denise Sisman, who is the CEO and of the Community Care Network of Kansas, and she has her full membership meeting going on right now, and so she couldn't join at noon today, but I'm filling in for her until she gets uh, back, um, and she may be able to join us before we're done here today. But uh, Community Care Network is the uh, state system of community health clinics, FQHCs, lookalike programs. Uh, around the state that are doing uh, integrated uh, primary care, dental services, behavioral health. And I think the conversation about infrastructure and, and access and gaps is a place where the integrated care, uh, whole person care that you get in an FQHC and a lookalike program uh, fit in to, to be a part of the, the, the broad range of the systems. So. Thank you. Um, and next I'm seeing uh, Representative Arnberger. 
Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Tori Marie Arnberger. I represent Great Bend in Hoisington, which is in the center of the state of Kansas. Um, I, for my background, uh, I have an education background. Um, so I've worked with some kiddos with that. I'm also a CASA for my local area. So I've seen how certain mental health issues um, episodes can affect the home life and, and trauma that's happened. Um, I would say the, the one thing I would get, uh, the one, remove the one barrier is, and I've been a big proponent and advocate of this, is just the rural and urban divide. And um, especially being out, and I consider myself central Kansas, but to many people it's western Kansas and just how different we are out here compared to in, in uh, more urban areas. And uh, on the other side, I also have a aunt who works at our local, um, at our uh, center for counseling here. So I've heard lots and seen lots. So I have that little connection and, and uh, so hopefully that can be some help. Great, thank you. Then Representative Bishop. Hi there, I am was late joining, so I am assuming we are talking about barriers to uh, creating a system that is uh, more satisfactory for the state. Yeah, so if you could uh, briefly introduce yourself, um, keep it, you know, uh, reasonably brief, um, uh, any background that you bring um, that will be um, helpful for the group to know uh, related to the work of this group, and then we are um, um, giving our answer to the question, if you could remove one barrier um, from the mental health system through the recommendations from this group, um, what would that barrier be? Okay, um, my name is Elizabeth Bishop. I represent District 88 in Southeast Wichita. In terms of my background, I have worked for a United States Congressman. My area that I worked with in terms of uh, constituent services as well as legislation had to do with virtually all of the entitlement programs, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Social Security, uh, railroad retirement, you name it. A lot of that had to do with health. Uh, at the time that I was doing that, this was quite some time ago, was the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. So I was actually sitting down and reading the morbidity and mortality uh, report weekly, monthly. Um, I uh, serve on the Health and Human Services Committee. I became extremely interested in the issue of mental health, primarily from attending neighborhood meetings and hearing how often the needs of uh, the community in terms of mental health and addiction services came up in a report from the community police officers to those neighborhoods. So I get, became very interested in how we can address that, address it at a local level and what the system statewide looks like that where we can make some improvements there. In terms of the one thing, I believe it would be the need for a mental health hospital that could serve the South Central Kansas area rather than needing uh, the system where we send people all the way out to learn it or, or the, all the way north to Osawatomie. And I'll stop there. Great, thank you. I'd like to ask the, the staff on the call to introduce themselves, but wanna pause to make sure I'm not missing any um, working group members, any working group members who haven't had the chance to introduce themselves yet. Not hearing any, um, I think I've said, my name's Carly Houchin. I'm a senior analyst at the Kansas Health Institute. Um, I will be um, supporting the work of, of this group throughout, um, through facilitation, agenda building, um, et cetera. I'd like to first invite um, a couple of my colleagues from uh, the Kansas Health Institute to um, unmute and um, introduce themselves. Sydney? Sure. Hi everyone, my name is Sydney McClendon. I am an analyst at the Kansas Health Institute with Carly. Happy to be helping support the work of this group. Previously, I also helped support the mental health task forces whose recommendations you guys will be reviewing. Great, and Peter? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Barstad. I'm an analyst at KHI, and I look forward to helping support the work that you're all doing. 
Great. And I think we also have a couple of staff um, on the line from Kansas Legislative Research Department. Um, KLRD, would someone like to kick off introductions there? Um, sure. My name is Marisa Bayless. Um, I'm a research analyst at KLRD. I typically, and during the session, staff um, House Health and House Insurance, as well as the um, Joint Committee on Cane Care Oversight. Um, and I'm happy to be working with the work group and hopefully can provide any help that you need. Hi, I'm Irai Daor, and I'm also an analyst at Legislative Research. And um, I work in the area of health as well, uh, staffing both the House Health and the Senate Public Health and Welfare Committees. And I've been doing that uh, for the last 10 years. Great, thank you. We're also joined today um, by our partners in the Revisor's Office. Um, so we'd like to invite um, the staff on the line from the Revisor's Office to both introduce yourself and then feel free to take us into our um, second agenda item, the, the brief coma and Cora um, overview. Okay, good afternoon. Um, my name is Jenna Moore and I am with the Office of Revisor of Statutes and it's just our job for those of you who aren't familiar um, with what we do is just to make sure that the law is clearly um, and understandably presented to you um, to help you aid in making your recommendations. Um, I have worked with the office for five years and I staff um, Senate Health as well as Senate Judiciary and House Corrections among others. And um, I'm just happy to help the group however I can. And with that, um, I will start with the coma script. Um, so just bear with me. I'm sure you have all heard this several times before, um, but um, this off this meeting is subject to the Open Meetings and Open Records Act. And uh, here's the script. Um, due to health and safety concerns, members of the public are not in attendance at this meeting of the Special Committee on Mental Health Modernization and Reform Working Group on System Capacity and Transformation, but full access to this meeting is being conducted by medium of interactive communication, allowing members of the public without cost to listen to the meeting through the use of live stream audio broadcasting on the internet and teleconference as available. Um, this video can be accessed on the youtube.com webpage by searching for the Kansas Health Institute or KHI live channel. The agenda and all documents for this meeting have been provided by the Kansas Health Institute. Additionally, a link to these documents has been provided in the comments section of the YouTube video previously referenced. Each member of the working group and staff shall state their name and title each time an individual begins speaking or voting so that the individual can be readily identified by remote listeners. All participants are required to ensure that microphones, phones, or other electronic devices are muted when the participants are not speaking so that the ability of remote listeners or observers to hear the proceedings is not unnecessarily impeded. Public comment will not be allowed at this meeting. During this meeting, the community will not recess to a closed or executive meeting pursuant to KSA 754319 and amendments thereto and each motion, if any, will be clearly stated before the working group votes and the chairperson will announce the final results of the vote. And of course, if you have any questions about um, compliance with um, the Open Meetings Act or the Open Records Act, um, our office will be happy to assist you um, however we can. Great, thank you. This is Carly Houchin at KHI. I'll um, a test that I find the most challenging thing to remember to do is um, to say my name um, each time I get, begin speaking. So I'll just highlight that for everyone as I, I think that's um, a challenging practice to get used to. So, so bear with me there. The next item on our agenda is um, a brief discussion of, of working group process. Um, so as you um, likely saw in review of documents ahead of the meeting, um, there's um, four topics that have been assigned to this group data systems, interaction with the legal system and law enforcement, system transformation, and telehealth. Um, we have a lot of ground a lot of ground to cover, excuse me. Um, so to support the group kind of moving well um, through each of those topics between now and um, the special committee meeting in early December, um, we'd like to offer some uh, ground rules or, or meeting commitments to the group. Um, I'll, I have a couple, a handful here that I'd um, suggest to the group. If there are any um, edits or additions that this group has to them, those are um, more than welcome. 
Um, so if there's um, past collaborative part, uh, processes that you've been a part of that you think have really benefited from um, a certain practice here or even just some lessons learned from um, the, the multitude of meetings now happening in the virtual space, um, those suggestions are certainly welcome. Um, but just to run through quickly, um, those meeting commitments that we would offer up as a starting point um, would include the request that working group members um, come ready to both discuss and compromise. So what this could look like is reviewing any materials in advance, um, acknowledging in this process that we're, we're looking for um, consensus rather than competing agendas. Um, also want to encourage people to be ready to jump in to participate. So, so any um, dead air after a question is asked is, you know, is time wasted as we think about the, um, the volume of information that we really have to consider here. Secondly, and this meeting commitment was uh, adopted by the, from the mental health task force, and I think it uh, served them well. Um, they had an agreement to keep remarks both succinct and on topic. So they committed to, you know, keeping it short. Um, doing their best not to reiterate points once they'd been raised. Um, they committed to, um, once uh, they'd addressed or spoken on a topic, allowed others to uh, weigh in before they shared any follow-up thoughts or comments. Um, another meeting agreement that we'd um, adopt from the Mental Health Task Force is to ask everyone, you know, don't hesitate to ask clarifying questions. Um, with the volume of information that we have to get through, you know, want to be sure that we're all on the same page um, throughout the process. Um, the last kind of starting point suggestion I have is, is the commitment to start and end on time. Um, so this is something that I'll certainly support you in as your facilitator. Um, but the, the permission I need from you all here is to at times be uh, restrictive on the amount of time that we have for certain discussions, um, recognizing that there's just really a number of important issues um, that we will um, um, sometimes need to limit comments in order to be sure we have time for all of the um, necessary and um, relevant uh, discussions. Any questions on those um, additions or, or, or clarifying comments? One point I might reiterate, um, this group will operate by consensus, um, so, so, so we don't anticipate you know, taking votes um, or anything of that nature in this process. Okay, so I'll, I'll note for you here, one of my facilitation practices is um, I'll, I'll wait 10 seconds to give people a chance to uh, mull things over. And if I get to 10 counting in my head, I'll, I'll just go ahead and move us along. Okay, so that takes us to our next agenda item. So if you're following along, we're at Crosswalk Discussion and Brainstorm. And here I might ask working group members to, to pull out that um, crosswalk of existing recommendations that KLRD put together. Um, this was, um, sh you should have received this uh, via email um, ahead of the uh, meeting. Um, that went out to stakeholders via email as well, but then is also posted at the link referenced on the khi.org website. Um, and so what we're going to do now is spend some time um, brainstorming some barriers um, related to each of the four topics assigned to this group. And what we're wanting to do here is really hear from, from those with content area expertise on the phone um, or on, on the call here. Um, as we look at the recommendations that have been drafted previously related to each topic, um, the question is basically what's missing. So we'll, we'll spend time, um, you know, on, we'll generally have, you know, one topic per meeting going forward. So we'll have some time to go deep related to some of the recommendations that have been drafted so far. Um, but we know that the um, existing recommendations, you know, might not be enough to get us to the idea of a, of, a, of a modernized mental health system. Um, so what we'll do here is go um, topic by topic. We'll have um, about 10 minutes for each discussion. Um, and each time I'll really just pose the question, uh, what barriers um, should this group address that are not captured in any existing recommendations? So hopefully that was enough instruction time to allow folks the chance to, to pull out their crosswalk of existing recommendations from KLRD. The topic that I'd propose we start with 
is data systems. Um, is that the, that's the first one listed under the system capacity and transformation, uh, transformation work group. And that's at um, page 10, um, or if you're in a PDF reader, it might read page 14. And I'll go ahead and um, start a timer here for 10 minutes, but would um, open it up to the group. Um, what barriers are not addressed by any of the current recommendations that you're seeing here that should be raised for the special committee? Carly, this is Kyle Kessler. Yeah, go ahead. And I would say, you know, in, in keeping my lens not only at, at the CMHC level, but as at the CAHEN level or Kansas Health Information Network, uh, as, as that's actually who I'm representing or was appointed by. Um, one of the things that we have not done very much of, uh, certainly from a recommendation standpoint, but even the discussion standpoint, I don't know that people have really been compelled or encouraged as much as we could have to get on the state's health information exchange. Uh, and, and so I think probably all but a handful of CMHCs are on. Uh, I, I think that more and more hospitals are getting on, but to be able to share that data and that information across system providers would be a significant advancement, I think, for treatment. And probably access to care as well. So uh, I think that looking at the engagement of or uh, intersection of our health information exchange in terms of how folks can, uh, how, how we can get more connectivity, connectivity I'm sorry, uh, would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Quick follow-up question on there. Are there any um, uh, initial barriers that come to mind? Um, what's, what's keeping this connectivity um, from Cahen from happening? Well, I think a couple of things. One might be that there are, there have been other competing health uh, information exchanges in different parts of the state, uh, probably South Central Kansas and Northeast Kansas uh, are a couple that come to mind, but then also depending on what the sophistication of your IT systems are, that, that becomes a factor as well. Um, I think that all the CMHCs now have electronic health records, but one of them, they're still trying to get the connectivity right with uh, KHEN, but I think that that should be something that we encourage more of. Great, thank you. This is Sandra with United, and I agree with Kyle. I was thinking about KHEN as well as I read through this, and um, I think cost may also be prohibitive um, for some of our smaller provider groups to be able to um, join KHAN and put um, their data in. And like Kyle said, the connectivity and um, the ability to get the information into the system. Sometimes it can be manual, which becomes very cost prohibitive as well. Great, thank you. This is Spence Cohn with OJA. Um, in, in thinking about what, what Kyle and Sandra just said, you know, I, I, I know everybody here except for me basically is in mental or in health system type of areas. So my question would be, how, how do we loop law enforcement into this? Sheriff's departments, police departments, probation departments, you know, so we, we operate under different rules and guidelines than everybody else here basically. So, so how does the confidentiality work when you're bringing in an outside agency um, such as the Sheriff's Department to be able to get that information? So I think that's something that should be explored on, on how, and I'm, I'm guessing that would have to be a legislative type of thing that makes it allowable pass that information on. And, and I could be wrong on that, but that's that's just kind of where my mind is at this point. Mm -hmm. Representative Land, where is your hand raised? Yes, I, you know, I'm just wondering on with this issue that we're talking about right now is if the uh, electronic medical records, is that something that needs to be expanded? Do we not have as much of that in the mental health side as we do in the physical health side? And this is Kyle Kessler again, and speaking for 
CMHCs and, and knowing that there are uh, certainly small providers, uh, private practice therapists that would not have the need for a sophisticated health record. But I, I think that part of the challenge that we had, even with the ACA, was that when there was funding available for expanding health records, they kept it limited so that behavioral health, uh, and, and Stuart may have some knowledge on this as well, but we were excluded and it made no sense. It was very frustrating. And I think that they've, uh, and, and Secretary Howard may have a better understanding of this as well, but I think that it has been opened up more recently, but uh, there was not the funding available for investment in this area the way that there could have been or should have been. Just about every CMHC that I'm aware of has found money within existing resources uh, or, you know, um, when, when they're able to decide funding uh, just to make that investment. It, it's a long-term, long-range investment and very difficult to raise, you know, a capital campaign. Nobody wants to pay, you know, uh, for, for an organization to get a new electronic medical record. That's not something you put your name on. So, yeah, funding certainly has been an issue, but uh, I think now that all of them, we're very different from other states in that regard. I talk to counterparts all the time that are still on paper claim systems that drive them crazy, and, and Sandra would probably have some knowledge about that in other states, and certainly that increases the likelihood of fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, but we're, we're doing better in Kansas in that regard. You know, this is Secretary Howard. I, I mean, I might speak actually just from the um, direct service side of KDADS. I mean, I think um, many people on this call know this, but some don't, that, um, that in terms of electronic health records at our state hospitals, um, we are so outdated. That's been a significant barrier to coordination of care, as well as lots of other things, um, you, know, you know, related to um, optimal reimbursement and the like. But you know, but kind of focusing on that coordination piece. Um, and so we, um, and so we're actually really pleased that we're moving forward now, and that the um, the legislature and the governor last year um, supported the beginning of that infrastructure. But that's just like a great example where you say, here's kind of a core piece in this system that really has been way behind. And, and I think as that goes on board, um, that, that will make a significant impact. Um, but there clearly are gaps. But, but I would also echo, um, I think, just the importance um, of, of Kyle's initial point um, in terms of um, the, the, the information sharing, um, the, the, just the promise of Cahan. Um, I think that there's, there's, still, there's definitely still some opportunity there. And I think it might um, serve as well at some point in this process to just think of, to be able to articulate clearly um, the benefits of sort of meeting the promise of that and, and how that might actually impact the system as a whole in terms of outcomes. Great. Yeah, Bishop. Oh, go ahead, Commissioner. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I was just going to say, I would add to that we we are right now in the process of getting uh, an RFP together for that electronic health record at the hospital. Um, and so one of the things that we've been working on is combining that that need for the electronic health record along with our need to replace um, the KCPC system um, on the SUD side. And so we, we are gonna be trying to find a single solution that addresses both of those issues. It's a, you know, an off the shelf um, uh, type product. Um, and I do believe that that would have opportunity for um, connections and um, um, uh, uploads, downloads from um, electronic health records at CMHCs and other um, mental health providers as well. Thank you. Seeing a hand raised, uh, Representative Bishop. Yes, uh, I'd like to mention the APRIS system. As I understand it, that is what kdh &E is using to attempt to track people that are going into an institutionalized setting and therefore having their Medicaid eligibility um, ended and uh, being able to track them so that when they come out of a jail or a hospital, it can be reinstated rapidly. It took a while to get that set up. I understand that the confidentiality concerns had to be addressed. It already was in existence for hospitals. I'm sorry, I live near McConnell. It can't be helped. <laughs> 
I don't know if you can hear all the airplanes going overhead right now. I'm having remodeling done inside, so it's even noisier in there. Um, APRIS was initially set up, as I understand it, to assist the uh, prison system in uh, alerting those folks that would need to know when someone was coming out of the system, such as the victim of an assault or something like that. And that has been built on for the KDH&E program, which is now about 80% networked in the state. Not all of the jails uh, are um, signed up as yet, but it's getting very close. Thank you. Thank you, Carly Houching, KHI. Wanna jump in to um, quickly pose um, one other question to the group related to this topic. Um, so as, as previously mentioned, we'll structure the rest of our meetings, basically one topic deep dive per meeting. Um, so related to data systems and some of these barriers that we've discussed, what additional expertise do we wanna be sure to have in, that, um, in this room um, for that meeting? Any names coming to mind that would be great supplemental experts to have in that conversation? Uh, yes, uh, Chris Schwartz might be someone that could, certainly she could address the use of the APRIS system if it is deemed that is truly relevant to what we're looking for. Uh, Chris Schwartz with KDH&E. And this is Kyle Kessler, and I would say Laura McCreary from KHEN. He's the CEO and president and could speak to some, some of what, and, and, I, and, I, and I think Secretary Howard mentioned it was perfect segue really, the, the connectivity with state hospitals, state mental health hospitals uh, is contingent on them getting a new EMR in place. And so what that could do for our admissions and discharge processes uh, going from CMHCs would potentially be a game changer. Thank you. Representative Landwehr. So Kyle, are you saying that with the, the, the systems that we've just heard about from uh, Representative Bishop and, and also Secretary Howard is that, how would that relate then out to the, the private sector, whether it's our CMHCs or other local health care, uh, mental health care providers? Well, and so, yeah, they're two very different systems. So APRIS, start, starting with what Representative Bishop was talking about, uh, I think that that certainly helps, and, and Spence may know this better than I do, but the, the law enforcement side and the, and the sheriffs and the county level folks uh, being able to suspend Medicaid versus terminate it, uh, I think that's the issue that, that we're at least partially talking about. Um, that, that's a big deal for county governments. Um, and then on the other side, with what we were talking about with the KHEN and the EMRs, um, the KHEN has a new product called Acute Alerts, which allows you to see when someone is going into or leaving inpatient hospitalization. So to connect them with community-based treatment that quickly, if it pops up and, and you establish these agreements, you know, for to see people's records through business associate agreements, um, then that, that helps the community providers track the health uh, and well-being of the patient much more quickly. Does that help? Thank you. Carly, may I interject something? Uh, and we'll, we'll consider this just a heads up everyone, the, the last comment on this topic, and then we'll move along in the interest of time to our, to our next topic for brainstorming. Thank you. Uh, I might mention that uh, Chris Schwartz is also an expert on the KEYS system, which I think is the Kansas Eligibility, et cetera, system for Medicaid, which might be part of this discussion. Um, I think the, the comments made by Kyle Kessler are extremely helpful because the other side of wanting the rapid reinstatement, and I'm sorry we're not allowed to use suspension because it doesn't agree with federal rules, but the rapid reinstatement of someone who's had their eligibility in, uh, ended. Um, we also need that, the other side of that, which is coming from the hospitals. And so putting those together, I think would be extremely helpful and I'm happy to hear, and I, I want to explore this EMR system more thoroughly. Thank you. Great, great discussion, everyone. 
Um, so we'll make note of all of these barriers and we'll kind of have them as a to-do list um, when we're having our um, deep dive discussion on data system. We'd hope to make recommendations that would um, address each of the barriers being brainstormed. So with that, we'll put a, a fresh 10 minutes on the clock here and would direct the group to the next topic um, assigned to the group, which is interactions with legal systems and law enforcement. And the same question stands, what, what barriers are not addressed by the current recommendations in that crosswalk from KLRD um, that should be raised for the special committee? Carly, this is Stuart Little, Community Care Network of Kansas. What page is that on the document, do you know? Yeah, if you're in a PDF reader, I'm looking at page 15, but it's um, numbered uh, page 11. And topic eight, the, the piece that I had stuck out to me, and again, this is Kyle Kessler. Um, we have not, I think, done nearly as much looking at the statutes and even the constitution on this. I, I was listening to a, um, a panel discussion the other day with a couple county commissioners at our annual conference and the Association of Counties has on there a new public policy agenda looking specifically at Article 7, Section uh, 1 of the state's constitution, which talks about the responsibilities of the state hospitals and how that connects to uh, County governments and obviously the sheriff's offices, the police departments are a big part of that. And so uh, it may be that, and, and I don't know exactly how to recommend this, but uh, that piece of the constitution is very significant and and there have not been lawsuits brought on it yet, but the, the, the pieces relating to our state hospital moratoriums and the local law enforcement, uh, has been an, a very, very, very loud topic uh, for four or five years now. And then certainly the Care and Treatment Act and the Mental Health Reform Act probably feed into that conversation as well in terms of what the local responsibilities are supposed to be. So I, I, I fully recognize I didn't come out of that with any recommendation. Uh, I'll keep thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. And, um... Honestly, at this point, just as clearly as possible, if we can articulate barriers, and then the, when the group goes deep on the topic and kind of the topic specific meeting, we can um, try to have some of those additional experts in the room and we can, you know, brainstorm our way to a recommendation at that point. But really our goal today is articulating barriers um, related to the topic. So interactions with legal system and law enforcement as, as clearly as possible. Carly, this is Sandra Berg with United and one of the, um, things that I thought of when I looked at this section was around um, those really high acute mental health individuals coming out of the correction system and finding housing for them. We continually run into issues with having the appropriate support in a housing situation for these folks that are high acute, um, may have high risk behaviors, um, you know, we just, it, it's a struggle for us as a managed care organization, even to find those resources within the community. Yeah, and I, I would also say like there's, um, I think a barrier around children who, um, once they've uh, received competency evaluation and restoration services are deemed unrestorable or non-restorable um, and what to do with those children at that point. Um, we don't have detention centers really. Um, they're used for protection of people's individual safety at that level um, or age group. And so, um, you know, th there has been some challenges um, even recently in how to handle those children. Are you talking about, I'm sorry, just butted in. Are you talking about um, the kids that are sink that we're keeping out of the juvenile justice side? So these these wouldn't necessarily be sink cases. Um, th these would be children that um, had some offense that they were that brought them into touch with law enforcement and the judicial system, 
and then um, they were ordered for a competency evaluation to determine if they could stand trial. And their competency restoration services were not successful, and so they were deemed non-restorable uh, and unable to stand trial. Um, because they're unable to stand trial, then that puts them in a category where they fall into custody, potentially under Care and Treatment Act of the um, Secretary of KDADS. Thank you. Yep. Definitely welcoming um, additional comments on barriers related to this topic, um, but also want to raise the question again, if there um, are those with supplemental expertise that we should be sure to have um, in this virtual room whenever we're having the deep dive conversation on, on legal system and law enforcement, um, those names are welcome um, as well. This is Andrea Clark with KADS, and I added um, a suggestion in the chat about uh, potential subject matter experts with in Johnson County County Management. They're my resource connect system. They've been able to um, kind of build a system that connects across, at least for adults, uh, connects across law enforcement, judicial, um, behavioral health partners um, in a way that is kind of follows the pretty strict privacy standards that each of those have kind of their, you know, their different levels of complications. So they might be able to, um, Chris, Chris Schneewise um, in their, in Johnson County might be somebody that can speak speak to that at least at a county level. Great, thank you. And Carly, do you know if we have uh, the, the law enforcement appointees, the chief, chief of police at Hayes or the sheriff from Pawnee County, are they assigned to this committee? Or yeah, so um, that's a good question. So um, a couple of them were able to attend the special committee. Um, I don't know, um, we'd have to follow up again with them to see if they had basically the, the capacity to commit to um, volunteering for the working group. Um, but we can follow up there, definitely recognizing um, the expertise that those individuals have. Because both of them and then the appointee of the uh, district, County District Attorneys Association, certainly Sher Sheriff Easter is always a, a good resource from Sedgwick County on these kinds of issues as well. Those would be the names off the top of my head. Great. Seeing a, um, a hand raised, Representative Landwehr. Well, and, and Kyle kind of stole my thunder, but he does that on a regular basis. Is uh, no Sheriff Easter, I think, would be one. And then you may want to visit with the uh, Chief of Police out of the city of Wichita, because I know that we've done quite a bit with having teams that when law enforcement comes in contact with an individual that's uh, they identify as being a mental health issue, then this team comes out and then they've got social workers, et cetera, because our law enforcement are not social workers and I don't think we want to make them social workers. Uh, so that would be another one along with Easter. Great. That'd be Chief Ramsey, I'm sorry. Chief Ramsey, got it. And, um, Spence Cohen, did you have a, a comment there? Yeah, Spence Cohen with OJA, and I apologize, Carly, if this is not exactly what you're looking for, but in looking at this, this crosswalk, um, just a note that I make is that the recommendations rely heavily um, towards juveniles. You know, there are a few things that are adult, and I think um, corrections, you know, it's, it's, it's very adult-oriented, so that, that's mostly where we, we deal with people, especially with the new juvenile laws, so we don't get as is probation supervision don't see as much um, juvenile interaction as we used to. So I think it, it's important to, to see what can be done for adults as well in the correction system. Um, as, and then adding on to that, again, I apologize if this isn't a barrier, but I think um, looking at to, to how we can do more type of, um, once someone's been arrested, if it's a mental health issue, how we look at responding to them in the courts, um, in specialty mental health type of courts. You know, that's that's something that there are a district or two that are, are working on it. But I think that that should really be looked at how we expand that across the state. And I know the Supreme Court's also looking into this issue, but how, how you deal with people once they've entered the, the, the system, the court system, um, and move forward addressing specific mental health issues. Great, thank you have less than a minute on the clock here. Do we have um, 
um, any last barrier or last expert that the group should raise related to this topic. Okay, um, not hearing any, topic three assigned to this group is system transformation. So same question on the table, looking at that um, roster of existing recommendations, um, what barriers are not addressed? Ready, set, go. And in case the page number reference is, is helpful again, so topic nine, um, labeled page 13 um, in a PDF reader, page 17. This is Kyle again. Um, one that is not mentioned on this, but I suspect is in a different part is the Certified Community Behavioral Health Centers and the CCBHC model. We've been hearing a lot about that at our conference this week and even over the last several months. Uh, it could be in any one or all three of the work groups, but the, the, the transformation or the transformative process of that model of care really touches all three work groups pretty easily when you think about uh, outcomes and uh, access to crisis services that really connects even with the uh, interaction with law, legal system and law enforcement uh, might be worth us touching on if possible too. Great, thank you. Other barriers? This is Sandra. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the barriers that this all could be rolled into is the integration topic that Stuart brought up around um, integration with dual diagnosed with substance use, dual diagnosed with IDD, um, mental health issues, the physical health component of it. And I think um, a system transformation that I think we, we continue to run into is that whole integration piece. Um, being siloed and not having systems that cross over or talk to each other. And this is Spence Cohen again, and this is with OJA, I'm sorry. Um, this is kind of what I spoke to at the very beginning. When I look at system transformations, you know, I think, uh, and this is what I stated at the beginning, the barrier I see is, is making sure that we're treating people in the court system the same as anybody else as, as far as costs are concerned because that's something i see that that can be transformed to help um, offenders pay the same cost as everybody else throughout the whole system and i think that's a big something that doesn't occur right now great thank you Certainly open to hearing more barriers, but also if there are um, supplemental ex experts related to this topic, um, that we could um, toss those names out now as well. This is Stuart Little with Community Care Network. I just wanted to follow up on, I think, Sandra's comments and Secretary Howard's comments at the beginning, kind of about infrastructure. You know, I'm, I've been around almost as long as Secretary Howard and coming out of mental health reform that kind of set up an infrastructure I think some of these recommendations on this list, I think have pointed out some of these barriers, for example, in the child welfare uh, or in the, um, in the Governor's Behavioral Health Planning Council, the, the PS recommendations there about connecting up from emergency room through the state hospital, through a lot of those folks. And then under the Governor's uh, SUD uh, task force, some of those recommendations from the, the service integration S bird is important payment reform, those kind of things. Those that that's seems to be kind of that next transformation. If we're talking about transformation and modernization, to get some level of integration is uh, is a is a is, is I think the barriers some of the barriers are identified right here in these kinds of uh, uh, recommendations from prior groups. Thank you. Uh, should I just go ahead and speak up? Jump I have unmuted myself, so I thought I should. Uh, this is Elizabeth Bishop, and uh, South Central Kansas and around the Wichita area developed a collaborative coalition 
two or three, four years ago. And we've gone forward with a number of slight, rather innovative uh, directions. Uh, it's loosely based on the Bear County model from San Antonio. And uh, I would like to indicate that I believe Sheriff Easter could definitely speak to that and what we are working our way towards. But also Robin Chadwick of the Via Christi. She is the head of psychiatric services for, for Via Christi hospitals um, and has they have struggled to uh, address the capacity issue, including the emergency departments and the issue of boarding before you can get someone into the actual system. I think she could address that really well and the need for a regional residential facility that could be integrated with community facilities at the same time so that we're not talking about warehousing anybody, but we need something here in South Central Kansas. And that's R-O-B-Y-N, Chadwick. Thank you. Thank you. And, and this is Kyle, and just to piggyback off of what Representative Bishop said, uh, I think that Joan Tammany at ComCare maybe either chairs or co-chairs that coalition along with Robin. So they do a, a nice presentation when, when we, as we're talking about experts on, on this issue. And so that piece of community, I mean, it's interesting to see how that bridges a couple of these different topics pretty well. But transformation is, is a good category for it. Any last comments on this topic? Uh, yes, Elizabeth Bishop again. When you ask about the major barrier, uh, what I brought up was the need for a, a hospital locally. Uh, for South, all of South Central Kansas. In addition to that, a close second as a major barrier is the workforce development issue. Um, and I think Robin would be uh, capable of addressing that as well, uh, as would Joan, Joan Tammany, Tammany uh, from ComCare. And I think uh, the, the system-wide approach that our working group is looking at uh, should also examine the issue of workforce development. This is Carly. I'll, I'll jump in here um, just to clarify. So workforce is one of the specific topics um, uh, kind of handed out by the special committee. Uh, the working group on finance and sustainability um, will be taking that up. And, and just with the restraints on time, they'll probably be the group that will, you know, have the chance to do the deep dive conversation there. Um, but I'm certainly happy to kind of refer some of those supplemental experts to that group. Carly, this is Sandra with United. Um, one of the things I thought about too was um, in our payment structure, particularly within Medicaid, we do not allow for parent support, parent um, training, unless the child's actively the client, which um, is spoken to in the tier two recommendation with the Child Welfare Task Force. We see that often, um, time and time again, especially when children are in, are in PRTF, the parents cannot get services because the Medicaid card shut down. Um, I think that's another one of our barriers is how do we support the family um, through our system of mental health when it isn't particularly the parent who's identified as the client, but they're still a part of the solution. And how do we bring them in? Great, thank you. Maybe have time for um, a final comment if we have it. If not, I'll do the count to 10 and move us on to telehealth. Okay, not hearing it. Um, uh, the next, the fourth and final topic um, assigned to this working group is telehealth as it relates um, specifically to the, the work of you know, system transformation, um, system capacity and transformation rather. Um, so, so let's get started brainstorming some barriers related to that um, and again just offering the reminder that this is one of the issues that's um, addressed by all three working groups. So if we can keep barriers to the greatest extent possible kind of in, in um, the purview of this group um, 
And then we, yeah, when we deep dive on that topic, um, we will go down our list and try to make recommendations to um, address each of these barriers. So this is Sandra again. Um, COVID threw us into a system transformation rather rapidly with telehealth. Um, we had to get things in place quickly so that people could act, get access to services. And I think it was a good um, trial period for us to do that. I think now we have an opportunity to look back and say, okay, what worked, what didn't work. Um, of course, it really expanded the offering of services for folks who couldn't get out, who were um, not able to access services. So I think it was a, a really good thing. Um, however, there are, were some needs that weren't being met because of um, access issues. People didn't have internet, they couldn't get through. So I think um, COVID has been a good trial period for us but it's also shown us where we have some work to do on defining the telehealth system in Kansas. Representative Blandware. Yeah, I think one of the things that we have to take in consideration is there a, is there an age, age limit uh, in where we want to use mental health. I know that there's been some concerns from some of the providers of, you know, children, because many times the therapists really feel like they need to have, you know, more of a, a, a visual and actually seeing the, the whole uh, body language of these kids. So I think that that's one uh, area that we have to definitely look at. Thank you. Yeah, so when it comes to system transformation and how we interact with law enforcement and jails, um, I think telemedicine has a real role to play there and it might be interesting to look at how we can um, eliminate some of the barriers around um, access to technology within the jails in order to facilitate that. This is Sandra again, one thing that um, we have experienced is the originating site that has to be where the member is or the client is and prior to COVID that was an issue um, if they had to travel to another office it kind of defeated the purpose so once once COVID is over then go back and look at what do we want to be able to offer to folks um, within the CMS guidelines or within guidelines that they can actually utilize the service where it makes most sense to them. Thank you. This is uh, Carly KHI. Um, once again, pose the question, any additional expertise that we should have in the room for a, um, a more extensive conversation on this topic? Carly, I can try to come up with some. I don't have them on the top of my head right now, but there's there's some groups that I've talked to that might have somebody that might be willing to come and talk to us. That'd be great. Okay. Um, I'll count to 10 one last time, see if there's any final um, comments, either barriers or experts related to the topic of telehealth for this group. Um, if not, we'll move on to our um, next agenda item. You know, it, it may be worth even talking to, uh, I know United Methodist Health Ministries is doing a telehealth survey and their CEO and president, David Jordan, has gotten pretty up to speed on this as well and would have a, a pretty good lens to look through, I think. Very good, thank you. Okay. 
thank you for that um, brainstorming work. So um, uh, Sydney's been keeping the list of notes for us. We'll have um, this whole list of barriers that we now will have to address. So um, as I said before, we'll go kind of topic specific at each meeting, get those extra, um, that supplemental expertise in the room. Uh, we'll um, review the recommendations that have been developed to date. And we'll look at our list of barriers and try and check things off in terms of recommendation development. Um, so that will be our, uh, a bit of our process moving forward. The, the next item on our agenda for today is to review our recommendation rubric. Um, so again, this was material that was um, sent out in advance, um, but I will put it on the screen here. I think I have the right document. Let me get to the top. Um, so what we're going to do um, for the next 10 or so minutes is pilot this rubric. Um, and so a, a question that I pose to the group is, you know, is there a recommendation looking at the existing crosswalk um, for which we think we have the expertise in the room that we could drop that language in here and, and use it as our pilot. Um, so be thinking about that. Um, and while you are, I'll give you a quick overview of what we're looking at here and, and how we'll plan to use it over the course of the um, work of the group. Um, so as mentioned, each meeting will be topic specific. So we'll have the recommendations, um, the existing recommendation language dropped in here. We'll, you know, start the discussion by overviewing that, see if there's updates that need to be made, um, you know, given agency updates that have been provided to the special committee um, or other sources. It's definitely one of the areas where it's um, helpful to have spent some time reviewing and, and making notes to that effect in advance. Um, and then we'll spend the bulk of our time, um, at least in our first meetings, um, trying to get to both an ease of implementation score and a potential for high impact score. So those two columns that you see listed there. To get to our ease of implementation score, which will be between one and 10, um, we will look at the considerations listed in, in the check, check boxes and some of the open field questions here. Um, so um, when we're thinking about ease of implementation, um, a, a program change is perhaps um, more straightforward to accomplish than a program overhaul or um, a brand new program. Um, if there are cost barriers to implementation, we want to be sure to make note of those. Um, this was something that was raised as a barrier uh, by, by several in, in opening comments, um, just the idea of uh, sustainability. So if there are any concerns for continuity related to um, the recommendation or, or changes that could be made to recommendation language to um, build sustainability into it, we would, we would make those notes. Um, then we would note any um, mechanisms kind of listed in this last checkbox that may affect the achievability of the recommendation. Um, I think in the discussion with the special committee, the example that was given is that a federal approval process um, has many pieces that are outside of our control. And so um, their timeline, timeline there gets, can get challenging. So from there, we're not counting boxes. It's not a super technical process. We'll discuss each recommendation by these elements, and then we'll ask someone, in the, you, you ask the group to throw out um, a score, one to 10, um, that we will um, uh, list there. Then we'll move on to the potential for high impact um, discussion related to each recommendation. Again, there's a list of considerations. Will it benefit a, um, a large population? Will it significantly impact special populations? And, and this list here was what was brainstormed by the special committee. Um, it's meant to kind of get us thinking about some of these groups, but it's not meant to be restrictive. So if there are other groups that we should consider, we should go ahead and list those. Um, also in the special committee meeting, we talked about um, the, the value in, in considering um, equity. In, in our approach to these issues. So would want to, um, in our discussion, consider if there are any who have been disproportionately impacted um, by the barrier that's being addressed by the recommendation um, and, and make any note of those here. And then if the recommendation would produce any cost savings in other areas, that's certainly always something that's valuable to know. And we would make note here. Again, we would just then go to the group and say, we kind of had, had discussion. Um, someone tossed out a score one to 10. Um, and if the group kind of is generally thinking that feels about right, that's, that's where we'll land it. Again, um, looking for consensus here, there'll be disagreement, but, but we'll not vote on each issue or anything like that. Um, another piece of information that I think is helpful to know, um, so this will be kind of our first pass, and then we'll um, go back through and, and look at them again for kind of a, um, something of a, a, a gut check test before they go to the special committee. In that um, kind of second review, 
we'll look at things like um, action leads. So who, um, what agency or entity has the responsibility for a next step? Some of that information might be in previous reports if it's exist an existing recommendation. So we would pull that forward, drop it in for the group to consider, have an opportunity to make any changes. We'd also want to list any key collaborating entities. So basically, who needs to um, be in the room in the discussion about how this should be implemented so it um, can be sure to not create any additional barriers. Um, the last thing that we would be looking at in kind of our second pass is the idea of uh, intensity of consensus. So um, want to be sure we're not just putting forward recommendations that score highly, want to be sure we're putting forward um, recommendations that um, meaningfully contribute to the modernization of um, the behavioral health system. So that will be kind of the last check in and, you know, the group will have the chance to veto and say, you know what, I, I remember why we talked about this, but this is not the most important thing as we're prioritizing. Um, and then throughout, I, I neglected to hit on this question um, earlier, but in our in our first pass through, um, we'll also um, look to answer the question for each recommendation. How does this recommendation contribute to modernization? Um, that was another um, question raised in the special committee, and I think is a helpful kind of touchstone as we're having these conversations in terms of thinking about scale, um, thinking about how we score things for, for both uh, potential, uh, ease of implementation um, as well as um, potential for high impact, um, thinking about what the answer to each one of those um, would be in the idea or in the context where we have um, a, a modernized system. The last thing that I think I'll say before we'll just jump into piloting this really quick is that um, a higher scored recommendations are the ones that would be considered our highest priority. So something that is very easy to implement would get a nine or a 10. Something that has a, a strong potential for a high impact would also get a nine or a 10. That was perhaps a lot of information pretty quickly. Um, can I answer any initial questions on that? This is Spence Cohen, Carly, and I'm just curious on the intensity of consensus. How, can you give me an example of how you would list something in that area? Yeah, it's it's kind of um, almost the, the gut check for the group as we're going back through it. At times in, in past work, um, people find that there have been recommendations that score really highly. Um, and so they end up in like this very high priority category of like the five things we want to make sure X, you know, X, Y, and Z entity does. Um, but even though they score highly, um, the group of experts in the room ultimately don't think they're that important or the most important thing for transforming this or modernizing the system in this instance. So um, I don't know if that's a that's not really sp a specific enough um, example, um, but I would almost say this is kind of our, our, our gut check um, right. as we're getting ready to put information forward to the special committee of saying, does everybody really think this is the most important thing? So, so is, is, it, is that just a yes or a no answer that, or like what kind of things would you actually write in there? Like if four out of 15 degree or disagree, mm -hmm. how, I'm just, and this is probably, I'm sorry if this is off topic, but how would you, how do you foresee that you would write that in there actually? Yeah, I think, so we're operating by consensus. So um, mm -hmm. if um, someone, uh, as we're doing this last pass through and, if someone as we're doing the last pass through says, you know what, this scored really highly. I don't think this is the most important thing. These seven other things that scored lower are actually probably more important for modernizing our system for X, Y, and Z reason. Um, someone, anyone could toss that out. And I think we would, you know, the group could then discuss it. If the group kind of generally agrees, we'd probably um, use this almost as just a discussion prompt to okay. move a recommendation somewhere else on our list. Okay. Does that make sense? So uh, I don't think we yeah. would use it so much to write a ton of narrative there. Um, I think we would use it as a point to check in to say, um, does what you're looking at look right or is something landing incorrectly? That, that makes sense. Just kind of a brief overview of, of the consensus. I get it. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. Anybody have a, oh, go ahead. Yes, if I could, Carly, um, I would just encourage the working group um, and the ease of implementation score um, just to consider if there are legal barriers to implementation. Um, if something violates HIPAA or has been found unconstitutional by a court, it would be a little harder um, to accomplish. Great, thank you. 
is there a, um, a burning recommendation that um, someone has in mind that we could pilot this rubric with um, maybe for uh, just a couple of minutes here? We're getting short on time. We see a hand raised by Representative Bishop. Yes, Representative Bishop here. I would uh, like to make a recommendation that we consider looking at uh, the system from a regional perspective. I keep talking about the needs of South Central Kansas because I have worked closely with the coalition here and that's what I'm the most familiar with. But I am not necessarily suggesting that we carve out South Central Kansas like it's its own thing. Uh, are there um, other regional specific um, ways that, that services could be provided um, that in different areas of the state? Um, specifically for South Central Kansas, we need another hospital um, locally. And I believe that the county would be um, a good partner for that, but I don't think they necessarily want to take the main um, lead. Uh, actually, they are, the county uh, uh, commission has talked about it extensively. So um, that is one thing that I would throw up is the need for an additional regional mental health hospital that is residential and that is uh, networked with community services so that you've got a system here locally, but maybe could be replicated in other areas of the state, at least from the standpoint of um, the network between law enforcement, mental health services and hospitalization. Great, thank you. Representative Flanwer, seen, seen a hand raised? Well, I think to go along with where Representative Bishop was talking about, as she refers to South Central, I think that you know, we, need, we do need to look at other locations for regional hospitals. And along with the discussion of, the, of a location in South Central is the services it would probably be able to provide for uh, Southwest Kansas as well as Southeast Kansas because of central location and also the fact that it's got a highway. I think that the other thing that we need to look at is how do we connect all of the services that we have in our communities together. Because there's a, there's a huge disconnect because when you start looking into who we have available to provide services, whether it's with the substance abuse, it's the mental health side, it's the, the behavioral health side, and sometimes those terms get used uh, jointly for different things, is how do we get them all working together? so that we're not dealing with turf issues of, well, this one thinks they're getting, you know, carved out and someone else doesn't think they're getting to be able to provide. And I think along with that, not only who has services available, but the hours av available for services. Because mental health doesn't happen just during the day. It's 24-7, 365 days a year. So along with the regional, I would say, how do, why do we take the existing services that we have and connect them to work? Because I don't think that, you know, just looking at new programs is our answer. Because if we've got programs out there that are not beneficial that we're currently funding, then we should probably, you know, cease doing those programs so that that money can be put into programs that are better. And, and we talk about the data piece of this, we have to have some accountability, and I mean true accountability. And I know that people get tired of me saying this, but I go back to the accountability of the tracing that we do, uh, or tracking, not tracing, the tracking that we do in the K-12 mental health program. We can prove to you, child by child, the improvements and the benefits that that provides. So how can we get that kind of data tracking within anything that we do on improving mental health services and availability in Kansas. So if we, if we boiled that down into a recommendation for regional services or regional hospitals and services? I think so. And I think that, 
you know, because it, let's say you did put one in the Cedric County vicinity, all right? That hospital still needs to connect with those local communities that the patients are coming from. And how do we, how does that, how do they stay in connection with? And that's why we need to get them closer so that they can stay in connected with their support system so that when they are released from the facility, they, we know that they've got services when they get back home and that they're not forgotten. Does that help clarify, Andy? Thank you. Great. And, and we'll, we'll, we've captured um, those thoughts um, in the notes here. So we'll, we'll have that to build upon um, uh, when we get into our future meetings. Um, Looking at the clock, we have um, about five minutes left in our meeting and, and, and we'll, um, we will end on time here. Um, so what I'll do is I'll actually um, turn off the a screen share for the recommendation rubric. I'm glad we had the chance to walk through that briefly so um, folks have a sense of some of the um, elements we'll be discussing in future meetings. Um, do have a, quick, a, a few quick administrative issues to address before we wrap up here. Um, the first of which being um, ensuring we have a, a working group chair and vice chair in place here. Um, so that was um, a request for, for volunteers was included in some of the um, scheduling information that was sent out. And I, I, I got one willing, um, one willing volunteer in Kyle Kessler um, to serve in that role. Um, so I am still looking for one volunteer. Um, I will briefly describe um, what some expectations of that role might be and then um, would also um, offer up to Kyle um, if there is um, anything he'd like to say about um, any uh, complementary expertise. If we're, you know, looking for for um, a chair and vice chair that kind of cover a pretty broad basis of knowledge, if, if Kyle has um, any thoughts there he'd like to speak to, um, those are more than welcome. Um, so, so briefly, the chair and vice chair of the working group um, might be among those asked to volunteer to present information from the working group to the special committee. Um, additionally, the chair and vice chair might be consulted by KHI staff on agenda development or other logistics to guide the work of the group. Um, and also would um, flag for attendees, um, only kind of our content expert members can serve in this role um, uh, rather than legislative members. So with that, Kyle, anything to say there on um, any complementary expertise to what, to what you bring to the table? Well, I, I would generally say that I, there are enough gaps in my knowledge that just about anybody on the screen could compliment me pretty well. Um, but I, I think that, that uh, really whether it's a state agency uh, or, or managed care or other association, I think that, uh, that, that this is certainly an engaged, in, engaged group. So, uh, that was the worst pitch I've ever done for anything, I think, so. This is Carly, and what I think I heard was maybe we'll take anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so if we have a volunteer, um, that'd be great. I'll give folks about 10 seconds to think about it, but please feel free to jump right in. Okay, not hearing a volunteer at this point. Oh, Andy's um, clicking on, in yeah. and off of me. I'm gonna try to cover our basis here. So Andrea, would you mind being a co-chair of the work group? Sure. All right, base covered. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, so the, the group um, uh, operating by consensus, we, we don't need to, to vote to affirm this. Um, I'll just take a beat and um, if there's any concerns, please feel free to raise those um, now. If not, we'll consider these volunteers confirmed. Okay. Um, so a couple of additional um, quick logistics. Um, one, keep your eye out from, for another scheduling poll from me. Um, we'll schedule meetings a month at a time. So, so two meetings at a time is what we're help, hoping to do with each of those scheduling polls. Um, if there is someone in your office who helps um, manage your calendar, 
um, please send me the contact information for that person so I can include them on any logistics or scheduling emails. Um, additionally, if you named um, any of the supplemental experts today and you have their um, email or other contact information um, right at hand, please feel free also to send me that information. I might already have it in some instances and we certainly have it in the notes so I can reach out if we don't, um, but you would certainly save me a step if you could just go ahead and send that information my way. And then lastly, um, you should have re received a, a handful of emails from me at this point. If I am not reaching you on your best email address, um, please shoot me an email with um, your preferred form of contact so that I can make sure to keep you in the loop. Um, Want to stay on the same page here. We've got a, a lot of really good work to do in um, a, a relatively short period. So um, look for more information from me. Um, that concludes um, our business for today and it's, and it's 1.30. Um, so if there's not anything from anyone else, um, I will go ahead and um, close the meeting. Thanks, Carly. Yeah, thanks, Carly. You did good. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your Friday. You too.